Hello and welcome to the Psych Summaries podcast. My name is Hannah and I will be having conversations with clinicians, academics and experts that have applications to the field of psychology and mental health. They have many years of experience, meaning they are trusted voices in niche subjects. But I invite you to consume the content with a critical perspective, since a one-size-fits-all approach rarely applies to mental health. I hope you learn something and enjoy listening. Today I chat to Mike Tipton, Professor of Human and Applied Physiology at the University of Portsmouth and Editor-in-Chief of Experimental Physiology. We discuss the current status of research into cold water immersion, anecdotal evidence surrounding mental health and widespread ideas such as immunity, mental illness, inflammation and much more. He highlights what factors swimmers need to think about when considering cold water immersion, as well as what may be at play in those that claim positive benefits from doing it. So welcome, Mike. Let's start with an intro to how you got into the work you do today. I was a very keen sports person as a youngster. I got into swimming largely through my parents. It did give me a love for the water. And then I went off and started to study exercise physiology and got really into human physiology, which I think everybody's into a bit Mm. because they like to know how they work. And as part of the MSc course I did at King's College in London, we visited the Institute of Naval Medicine down near Portsmouth in Gosport. And I met a guy called um, Frank Golden, who was a medic in the Navy, surgeon commander at the time, and was doing some work into swimming in cold water but from the perspective of the dangers of it and how it could impact on your survivability. Mm. By then, I was really into temperature regulation and how the body responds to temperature. And that combined my two great passions, really, temperature regulation and sport in terms of swimming. And so I went on and did my PhD. And then really, that, that was it, really. I was hooked into physiology, particularly human integrative physiology, and have spent, um, you know, my career subsequently looking at the human and extreme environments. So can I pick your brains and ask what some of the impacts of exposure to cold water can do on our physiology? Sure. Um, well, one of, the, one of the things that got me into cold water immersion was initially were the dangers associated with it. So worldwide, we lose about a thousand people a day to immersion, second or third most common cause of accidental death. In the UK, it's about one person every 20 hours, or one child a week. So, you know, th- this is right up there in terms of the number of people who are dying. And that's deaths. You can multiply that number by anything between seven and 10 for the number of people who don't die, but are left with life changing injuries so the very first research that we did was really into the um, hazardous responses associated with going to cold water and you can group those into four areas the initial immersion which we call cold shock which is sudden cooling of the skin that essentially stimulates your fight or flight response it's very activating it's all the stress hormones are released people hyperventilate their heart rate shoots up their blood pressure shoots up And the problem with that is if you go into water and you lose control of your breathing, there's a very good chance you'll take into the lung the very small volume you need to drown. And that volume is about one and a half litres of salt water for the average adult. Now, that gasp that I do when I first go into the water is between two and three litres. The next tissue to call, that's, that's driven by the skin receptors being called, or the superficial nerves and muscles in the particularly the limbs which are very exposed and the cylinders that cool quickly and that leads to physical incapacitation that's somebody who goes for a swim and after five or ten minutes finds they can't swim anymore unable to walk the hypothermia comes after 30 minutes despite the preoccupation with hypothermia the truth is that even a naked individual in icy cold water won't become hypothermic in less than about 30 minutes And then the final phase of the four um, associated with particular risk is actually the rescue. 
how people are approached in the water, what's said to them, how they're taken out of the water and how they're then treated. So, I mean, that was that was it. That was that was really my work for, I would say, 25 years of my career was looking at the hazardous responses and trying to mitigate them, seeing how to treat them, how to rescue people. And that all gets permeated out through the nice thing about human and applied physiology is you work with end users like the Royal National Lifeboat Institution, Surf Life Saving, International Search and Rescue Groups. But of course, right at the back of all of this is for years, people have gone to the sea for positive things. I mean, there are towns in the UK that exist because people used to leave London to go and take to the waters because it was thought to do good things for you. And so it, this is not a new phenomenon, but it's one that is kind of assumed that going into particularly salt water is good for you. And what we've seen probably slowly over the last, I would say, 10 or 15 years, maybe 10 years ago, I did a program with Prof. Alice Roberts, who was doing a, a series on open water swimming. And we went up to the Lake District. And at the time, it was, it was quite a novel thing to be doing. But it's just grown and grown to the point where there are now literally thousands of people who on a daily basis in the UK are going swimming. And the anecdotal evidence for this being a good thing to do is strong. So if, so if you like, you've come to this conclusion that cold water immersion is a kind of double-edged sword. On the one side, you've got all those nasty things that I talked about earlier leading to drowning primarily but also other, other problems, cardiac problems and hypothermia and post-immersion collapse. And then on the other side, you've got this, oh, this is alerting. This makes me feel great all day. This, you know, I haven't had a cold since I've been doing cold water swimming. My immune system's fantastic. I'm no longer feeling depressed. Now, there's a lot of anecdotal evidence out, out there. The problem is on the sort of nasty side of the double-edged sword, there's lots of research, lots of lab studies. It's well-researched, well-understood. All the mechanisms involved are well-understood. On the positive side of that double-edged sword, it's mostly anecdotal evidence. Uh, now, there's nothing wrong with anecdotal evidence, but it is the weakest form of evidence. And so what we've been trying to do latterly is try to say, OK, well, how could some of these perceived benefits actually be coming about? What are the mechanisms? It's all very well me saying, well, I haven't had a cold for a year since I've been doing cold water swimming. But how could that happen? What could we test when you go cold water swimming? What's the active ingredient? Is it actually the cold water or is it meeting up with friends? Is it going into a beautiful area? Is it having a big cup of coffee or a big hot chocolate afterwards? Is it actually engaging in exercise? Is it being in the water and it does, it does it have to be cold? So all of these are really fascinating questions, which we're trying to you know, delve into as we speak. I know you said that it's weak, but the fact that that anecdotal evidence is there would suggest that you actually might find links in experimental conditions. So for anyone that is listening to that, I will definitely tag your website so that people can keep up to date anecdotally or not what is supposedly happening on a physiological level to your nervous system when you are in that cold water is it that initial skin response that you mentioned or is there more going on so we're a tropical animal we want to be lightly clothed in air at about 28 degrees Celsius, uh, because that's where we evolved. And we, have, we haven't actually changed in the centuries since we started in Southeast Africa. What we've done as we've migrated to colder parts of the planet is we've built houses, caves, fires, clothing. And if we look at the skin temperature underneath your clothing, my clothing now, it'll be exactly the same as it would be if we were naked in 28 degree air. So we've used our intelligence to recreate next to our skin, the tropical environment from which we evolved. And I know that because if you ask somebody if they're comfortable anywhere on the planet, in the frozen north or in, on the equator, any person, and they tell you that they're comfortable, I guarantee their mean skin temperature will be around about 33 degrees Celsius. 
which is what it would be if you were naked in 28 degree air with a deep body temperature of 37. So what could be an enormous stress for us? Well, an enormous stress for us can be going into water. The average water temperature around the British Isles is about 12 degrees Celsius. That's that's way below the temperature we want to be in. And also water is very different to air as a fluid. Water will very quickly take heat away from the body and it will continue to take that heat away from the body without warming up itself. And so that means when you first go into cold water, your skin temperature plummets and you get what we call this cold shock response. We named it that back in the 1980s, because not because it's a medical res um, response, but because it's just shocking, you know, and everybody's experienced to some extent when somebody starts running the tap downstairs when you're in a shower and things like that. And it, it's a nervous response. It's, it's stimulated by the cold receptors, which are about 0.18 millimeters below the surface of the skin. And it drives the breathing and the heart rate response. And you release lots of stress hormones. So you're releasing adrenaline, cortisol, and then beta endorphins. And, and this sort of milieu of increased stress hormones is what people report as, wow, I'm, you know, I've been, I'm awake, I'm alert, I'm a, I feel really alive. That's because you've evoked a response that is there essentially to save your life. And it's the fight or flight response. And that's why your breathing's going up and your heart rate. Now, the thing about the fight or flight response is because we're a terrestrial animal, it's fine in air. I mean, it does prepare you to run away from a predator or fight. Of course, it's really completely inappropriate in water. It's there because it's a response, but losing your ability to control your breathing when you're in water is a really easy precursor to drowning. The reason people feel so good and alert and alive and awake when they go into water is because of that neural response, starting with the cold receptors that releases all of those stress hormones. Now, moving on, those stress hormones can also provoke the immune response, the immune system. In so doing, they can ready the immune system for other challenges. Now we're, now we're moving along from scientific facts to hypothesis, but you've got to start somewhere. So one of the arguments is that, you know, that, that repeated immersion in cold water, that going into cold, kind of stimulates the immune system and readies it for another stressor. The other thing that we know, or we think we know, is that when you look at people who go into cold water, if there's a benefit, it tends to be with shorter term immersions. If they've gone in the water and they've gone in too long and their deep body temperature has started to fall, their immune system seems to be compromised. So it seems to be that it's, um, it's that cold shock response, that sudden fall in skin temperature, we would hypothesize, may well be beneficial in terms of preparing the immune system. The jury is still out to some extent because the work which we've done and others has not been clear cut in terms of when you actually move away from the anecdotal accounts and actually measure that, for example, the number of upper respiratory tract infections, which people do open water swimming get, they don't seem to be any different to people who are doing indoor swimming. So it may well be it's just exercise, but it's a difficult area to work in because you can measure lots of the biochemical aspects of the immune function. You can measure leukocytes and different immunoglobulins, and you can see them changing, but it may not be reflected in how well somebody feels or vice versa. They may feel better, but see no, you may see nothing in terms of their blood biochemistry. But that's the working hypothesis at the moment. The other side of the equation is to do with inflammation. There are lots of conditions now which are thought to be associated with an inflammatory response. So atrial fibrillation, inflammatory bowel disorder, type 2 diabetes, Alzheimer's, and some forms of depression. And one of the things we think may happen is that as you repeatedly go into cold water, you adapt or habituate to that response. And so your inflammatory response to that, you know, the, the number of chemicals you release that are related to inflammation, uh, inflammatory cytokines, actually gets reduced as you habituate. And we know that because we know that if I measure the cold shock response, it will be reduced by about half with as few as six, three or four minute immersions in cold water. 
So you can definitely adapt to cold, which is what cross-channel swimmers do and those who go in the water regularly do. And we think there might be a cross-adaptation at the cellular level between going into cold water and having that habituation and some common pathway that is then habituated for other stresses. So other stresses, which might be some form of infection, could be a psychological stress, don't produce such a large response. Again, purely hypothetical, but this form of cross-adaptation or cross-tolerance is the cornerstone of the hypothesis for why cold water immersion may well be beneficial for things like depression, Alzheimer's, um, yeah, and other, other things. We've seen recently studies saying that, for example, habituated individuals who swim regularly have different levels of a protein that's important in the prevention of Alzheimer's, RBM3. We don't know why that is, and we don't know whether that's protective or not. But, you know, there, there, there's, there's information around there that we, can, we should start pulling together. And finally, what I would say is what we really don't know anything about is the dose of cold you need. So I mentioned earlier that we think that the immune system may well benefit from short exposures to cold, but may well actually be impaired by longer exposures. So in amongst all of this, what, what are the mechanisms by which these things are helping, if they're helping, is also... What's the dose of cold you need? How long do you be, need to be in the water? Does all of you need to be in the water? A cold shower is not a powerful a stimulus as a cold immersion. But does a cold shower work? And if a cold shower works, well, what about just immersing a hand and a foot, doing a cold presser response? Does that work? And of course, once you get down to that level, it becomes really interesting because you may well find that if you get some benefit from just a cold presser response, this is now doable. You know, there's lots of people who are never, ever going to go and take up cold water immersion, swimming, you included. And they're never going to stand under a cold shower every day. But they might think about putting a hand or a foot into cold water if it had some beneficial effect. Now, again, we're really as far along the branch as we can go in terms of speculation and hypothesis. But these are the kind of questions that need to be addressed before we can identify what the pathways what the mechanisms and what the potential practicalities and use and utility of this is there are other things it's just worth mentioning when people take up cold water swimming and they become cold habituated they feel really good about having conquered that challenge so there's a psychological phenomenon there which is i think independent of any of the physiology we've discussed the other thing that's definitely going on at the moment is there are so many people telling other people that cold water swimming or cold water dipping is good for you that there's an enormous placebo effect running. And, you know, now I, you know, I don't mind if whatever works for you, that's great. If me telling you that, you know, taking a sip of coffee makes you feel better and you take it and it does, then that works. But as a scientist, what I want to know is why is so important because this consensus around cold water swimming but not just cold water swimming other things that we can do for our well-being and whether physical or mm. mental health it's really important for that to be backed in the research and it's quite scary how quickly things boom because they become popular and mm. vogue cover them and then suddenly people are following this guidance that isn't actually quite there are there any particular studies that you're working on at the moment that are due out soon that might be able to give us any actual advice okay so you you, you raised several really important issues there and I'll, I'll take them briefly one at a time firstly you raised the issue of expertise and one of the things that's very noticeably different in the modern era with particularly social media is that people can, you know, they can read a couple of things. They can talk to a couple of people. They can have a go for a couple of dips and all of a sudden they're the expert on whatever it is. I mean, it doesn't it could be cold water immersion, but it could be anything. I mean, you know, the Internet is full of blogs and this, that and the other. The question I would just particularly when you're talking about something which is potentially life threatening. The really important thing to know 
is find out who it is that's giving the advice and what their track record is and what their evidence base is. You know, we've got, and this has become a societal problem with fake news and people believing there are alternative facts. I know, you know, there, there aren't. And there are those of us who spent our whole careers training to pursue the truth that are, you know, more than a little worried that people don't understand the rigor that is required to come to a, a conclusion. So that's number one. So I would just encourage anybody who's interested in this or any other area, don't believe everything you read. Find out what the source is. Find out if they've actually done any experiments. Find out what the basic data were on which they based their conclusion. Because, you know, surprise, surprise, they could be completely wrong. The next thing to mention is that when you're dealing with something that is potentially dangerous, then... What we really need to do is get people, if we think it's also beneficial, but the downside is you could die, is to make sure that people do this in a safe way. If they want to take it up, do it in a safe way. And it's no coincidence that we had lots of people take this open water swimming, open water dipping up in the summer, and now they're getting into trouble. Because instead of the water being 18 degrees, it's now eight. And the Coast Guard call outs for people getting in trouble swimming have gone up by 50%. Now, this is not just getting into trouble. This is potentially dying. So if you're going to take this up, yeah, of course, we want to encourage people to go into beautiful places to exercise, to do good things. But please do it safely. Please have a medical checkup to check you're okay. Please do it with a club or with other people. Do it in a controlled way. Stay in your depth. Don't go in for more than 10 minutes. You know, there's a whole host of things you can do to make this activity but emphasize the benefit and minimize the, the you know, potential problems. Yes, we're doing research. Yes, it's hard, but it's incredibly hard to get it funded. You know, if I write a grant application for something on drowning or something on hypothermia or sudden cardiac death, I've got a reasonable chance of getting that funded. If you start writing grant applications to do work on, you know, the benefits of cold water immersion for depression, then the chances of getting that funded are a lot less. It's almost out in the homeopathic area in terms of its funding level. That doesn't mean we can't do it. It just makes it slower. So, yeah, we'll be publishing some work on upper respiratory tract infections um, and open water swimming soon. We have been working with another group, and your listeners can go online and look at 100 Days of Vitamin C, where with the C is spelled S-E-A. Bethany has been doing open water swimming now for a year as part of a treatment for migraine and has found that to be beneficial. And she's also, interestingly, when she couldn't go to the sea, she would take cold baths and found that to be beneficial, which is interesting because it takes out some of the other potential variables like exercise and being in a nice area. Um, My colleague, Dr. Heather Massey, is doing quite a lot of work on the impact of various water-based activities, including open water swimming, on people's perception of their well-being. So those those papers are starting to appear. But in terms of the sort of biochemistry and the actual mechanistic aspects of this, we're struggling to get anything done, partly because of the area, as I said, and partly because, of course, we're all living under lockdown and can't get anywhere near a laboratory. I think you've highlighted a massive, massive important point in research that it can often have a huge bias because it's only funded in the areas that people want to know about. And so it's not to say that the lack of research means that there's not going to be research, but as you say, it might just take time. But it's really, really interesting. And I'm really glad that I've actually been able to speak to you today because When I was researching for this interview, there was such a huge variety of answers saying that there is the research out there. And clearly talking to you, yes, there is some anecdotal research and it's developing, but it's not clear. And it's just really, really important to know where we're at with it. And I really, really appreciate you actually explaining that. And I hope for anybody listening, they realise that, yes, it can be a really fun thing to do. And yes, it can be amazing for your health, but that could be due to exercise or socialising. And you have to 
look at this from a perspective of being safe because that fact that you threw at me earlier that the coast guard calls have increased is really terrifying (laughs) because i'm sure people don't realize that actually it can be dangerous it's a very hostile environment and so you need to treat it with respect hence the rnli campaign you know respect the water and you know that doesn't mean you don't have to do it it just means that you do it safely and i've listed in some of the ways that you should do that if people want an update on where the research is at the moment, then I um, recommend the a paper that we wrote called Cold Water Immersion Kill or Cure, which they can get on the Experimental Physiology website. It's um, open access, so you can you can get it and read it. And that tells you where we are on both sides of that double-edged sword. Yeah, but it's, it's like everything else. Is I think it's our duty to try and find out why things happen and to try and help people not stop them do things, but make sure they're fully aware of the pros and cons before they make their own decision as to what to do. Thank you so much for explaining all of this. I really, really appreciate you taking the time. It's really been fascinating hearing where we are right now and hopefully the future direction. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks so much for listening to today's episode with Professor Mike Tipton. It's very clear that this research base is still in its infancy, but its future directions could provide promising findings. If you are an avid cold water swimmer and feel the benefits, then please continue to do so, but in safe conditions. If you want to hear more from leading experts, then please do follow at Psych Summaries on Instagram for more, where you'll find links to other published episodes. And if you enjoy them, then please do consider donating to my Patreon. Thanks for listening and I'll see you next time.